great show, tough act to follow. Quite unlike the last time you and I were on stage, one after the other. Same room, I think, right? Okay, even tougher act to follow. I was here yesterday spying on both uh, Catherine and Daniel, and uh, they had some kick-ass talks to give. Daniel gave a really rushed version of it today again. <laughs> uh, those of you who had both rounds, I think you would have understood a little more. It was really super useful to me. I have actually honestly no idea what the hell I am doing on the stage between these two fantastic brains. One, a global expert at the metaverse, at the minimum, that's the only thing that I remember from the super long introduction that Kathy gave. And another, among the top ten people in AI in the whole world. This top I heard nine. from Catherine top herself, nine. right? Top, top nine? nine? Okay. <laughs> All right. Somebody died along the way, looks like. <laughs> what is in that box? Sorry. Dark humor, but permitted because I know that I'm standing between you guys and your awards and all of that. So, okay. So, what we are supposed to be discussing is future proofing marketing. Marketing is what we are most interested in. Future is the word that is certainly center stage today for all of us. But I'm based on everything I've heard over the last two days, I'm honestly inclined to believe that being able to say anything about the future seems like a mugs game and we are quite likely to fail. Catherine, what do you think? <laughs> I think you're not wrong. I think what's interesting about this panel and, and the composition of this panel is that we bring two different perspectives that are nevertheless very complementary in terms of looking at the future. So, you know, AI is the powerhouse that's going to drive many metaverse and Web3 platforms all of them in fact, but also we're looking at the discipline from two different perspectives. So the, it's what I call top down and bottom up, it's a typical financial or economic term, but it describes the analytical and data driven framework that drives so much of Daniel's work in addition to the sort of bottom up cultural behavioral patterns that we're observing empirically in the work that I do in the metaverse and web3 spaces. So it's super exciting to have this combination and really see how all of these things are coming together so that we have a better understanding of what we can expect in the future. Yeah, and it's very difficult, of course, to see what the future looks like, but um, which is why it's very important that we build adaptive organizations. You probably have heard that word more, more than enough now. The more adaptive we are, the more resilient we are. Uh, because the world is going to change rap rapidly over the next decade and those that survive are going to have to adapt to that ever-changing world. And you already know my opinion, which is to be able to adapt, we need to innovate and to innovate, we need to unlock the creative capacity of our workforce. Mm. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Catherine, I'm coming back to you. Yesterday you talked about how if we used words like crypto and NFTs, we would probably get cancelled too. And therefore, the emperor's new clothes are now called digital goods, among other things. Yes. Question for you from a young marketer's perspective. We don't want to be making the mistakes where we end up throwing money at the shiny object in the room. Neeraj, I'm not talking about your box. <laughs> and get caught on the wrong side, right? Because we don't want us boardrooms to be yelling at us saying, you threw money away at something that just doesn't work or didn't work. And we've seen numerous examples of those kinds. Even in my limited space of banking, I know we tr people have tried to do mobile banking apps on Blackberries and on wearables and we've fallen flat on our face. I myself, I confess readily, I attempted to do uh, hashtag banking, banking on Twitter once upon a time. Uh, it did do the little gold dust sprinkling on trying to create a patina for the brand, but beyond that, obviously, nobody ever used it. In that sense, is there a way are there some clues, some guidance you can give us on how do we d sift through what to say yes to and what to say no to in terms of spending money behind new technologies in the context of the metaverse, AI, etc. for marketers, particularly the younger ones in the room? I think if we're thinking about being at the frontier of these spaces, it's, it really requires a couple of things. First is we need to make sure that we delight, engage our audiences. We, we need to make sure that they're really that we're tapping into things that are interesting and relevant to them. So we need to add value to these experiences in ways that, again, that they recognize. And specifically, when I think about age, I think about Gen Z and Gen Alpha and the emerging behaviors 
that, that we see emer that we see emerging uh, in these spaces and the expectations that are evolving as a result. So if you add all these things together, it's, it's about creating value for a new cohort of target audiences that have new expectations and behaviors. And if you think about this and you put it together, then it really adds up to a new paradigm across platforms. And so at that point, you need to adapt your behavior across the different platforms so that you can adequately address them. So understanding the behavior then will inform what you need to do on these platforms to touch with the audience and community, and then knowing what they value on those audience community will inform how you have this reciprocal relationship. So I have these little acronyms in my head. One is you know, ADD, AGE, and I think it's AGE. But um, that's basically it is identifying the, the community, what they want, what drives them, and give it to them. But that requires iteration over time. There's no, th this is the thing, right now there is no one solution. Those, those kind of you know, cookie cutter solutions are gone. They've been gone for about a decade at least, but especially in emerging platforms, whether it's gaming or metaverse spaces, or, uh, or if you're thinking about places where you've got you know, digital trading marketplaces, all of those things will uh, have different demands. And you're going to have to you know, just think about what works for your brand. Thank you. Daniel, I'll spin that question slightly differently for you. Are there pointers you can think about showing us about what filters we should keep in our head when we attempt to use AI in the context of a marketing problem? You, you did give us some examples during your talk, but perhaps what you can tell us is, how do I watch out for what not to do and where not to throw my money? Yeah, so uh, we, I, I used a, a prioritization framework to, to make sure that when we're solving these frictions, they're really driving value, uh, to, to Catherine's point. So the, I guess you know, one of those criteria is data. Is the data available to help us answer the question? Sometimes it's not, but sometimes solving the problem is so valuable that you have to go and get the data. Um, so, so there's a whole set of criteria there, and I can share the slides, but is the data available? Um, what's the, the return on investment? Also stakeholders, are all of the stakeholders across your business bought into the solution? It's okay to be bought into the top, but if the people's lives that these technologies are going to be affecting um, are not bought in, they're gonna reject it. Um, is it gonna be maintainable? And also one critical um, criteria is reusability. So we build these expensive smart module solutions and, and actually you, you can reuse the underlying assets to solve other parts of the business. So for example, if you're doing feedback in your business or career development or pay setting or performance review, all of those things, you need to know the skills of people. So you don't want to build multiple skills profiling modules, you want one skills profiling module that serves all of those four. When it comes to marketing, you don't want to be building multiple brains that generate content, you want one brain that generates con content, you want one brain that represents how your audiences think, and not build multiple ones. Reusability is critical. I, I wanted to add to that because I think that's an excellent point in terms of the, the data that we can collect on user behavior. Increasingly, people think the metaverse space is that this is just a question of you know, how many people attended a specific event. But in a very short amount of time, we'll be able to have a lot more information about what users are doing in these spaces. Right now, it's uneven at best. But I will say that soon enough, we will have more individualized behavior, which will allow us to create more customized experiences that are AI driven. And we're also going to be able to analyze what's their share of wallet, because younger people especially have much greater facility opening up wallets and, um, and, and, and investing in digital goods sooner than they're likely to invest in, say, a savings account or open up an actual physical banking account. So they're going to have access to disposable capital within these gaming platforms, and that's already the case. And they're making allocation decisions for this, the, the capital that they, they own through either earned points or invested money. And so whatever, you know, it's kind of the, what's, show me what's at your wallet and I'll show you who you are. It's a new form of tapping into the, the identity of this person beyond the persona that they adopt in this space. And so 
as marketers, we're going to have greater insight, especially in the younger generations, because they will have invested so much of their own capital in both building, trading, selling, um, all of these, you know, their, their objects in these 3D worlds. And that will give us greater insights as to what they want and how to reward them and how to incentivate them. So I think that there are rich analytics to be had, not just from AI and external CRM systems, but certainly within uh, metaverse and gaming platforms. Super, Catherine. In fact, that segues to a thought that I had based on what you said yesterday about, you mentioned Nike having sold $200 million, if I remember the number right, of digital goods already. Was that right? It was 185 as 100, the third well, quarter of last year, so we can... It's rounding off. that, rounding it out, it's about so, 200 per year. Yeah. I went and looked that up last night and I found out that about, this is to do with one of their most popular uh, selling lines, the Air Force One, which is all the rage. Uh, I didn't know or else I would have worn them today. I would have bought them first. But this is not about the physical shoe. It's apparently you download the 3D virtual version of that shoe and you not only really download it, you download your own interpretation of the shoe apparently and so there are arguably a hundred thousand versions of that shoe sitting somewhere or the other and because I specified, I customized it for myself, now it's in theory a co-created digital good that I can also make money off along with Nike. Am I right about that? Yes, that's true. We actually did a series of that for Adidas. We created a series of, um, of avatars that was AI driven. You asked a couple of questions. It was the first time you use a, um, we used a personality, quest, a personality quiz that then determined your personality and they generated a character that reflected your personality. And then you could download this and it was interoperable, which means that you could use this avatar across multiple gaming spaces, which is also in itself fairly rare. We must have generated about a half a million within the first week. And some of them, you know, most people kept them, but there were a good portion who actually took those avatars and listed them on OpenSea, which is a digital, is a digital marketplace for branded goods. And they sold them. And so this is a great way of sharing these, the value, the passion of the brand without really forcing people to either buy NFTs or invest in crypto because you could pay with it with your credit card. And the second thing was, it's rewarding fans for their loyalty as opposed to trying to exploit fans for their loyalty. So rather than try to get rich quick and you know, make a, a quick buck off of your brand fame, it was a way of actually turning that around and saying, thank you very much for being so, so loyal. Feel free to play with this, but feel free to also sell it. And I thought that was a really beautiful way of uh, giving back. So here's the dinosaur question. My son who's a teenager now, 16, probably gets this. I am left wondering, I paid a ton of money or my, my son took a ton of money from my credit card, he didn't even get the damn shoe. So he's not going to get any exercise anyway. It's another matter that I bought the shoe and it's sitting in my shoe rack and I'm not getting any either. But is there a… is this okay, is this kosher that now Nike is selling just the idea of a shoe and I'm paying money for it? It's not exactly the idea of the shoe, because if you're thinking about people who spend on average two to three hours gaming every day, your swag means a lot. And I can tell you, having been in these spaces, I get very uncomfortable if I am not representing myself in a way that I think I should. So if I'm a dragon princess, or if I am a furry like, ball that kind of like, you know, pulsates, that's important to me in that space. It really is, and it's very hard to understand to generations that aren't used to being on gaming platforms, but each one has a different kind of, it's like if you're going to a certain party, or if you're going to a concert, you're gonna have different outfits for different occasions. And that's the case also in the metaverse. It's the case in different um, gaming worlds. So one might be you know, more, I don't know, more Western themed, and the other one might be futuristic. And so you'll want fits for every one of these occasions. And so it's important very much for the players to have that. What's beautiful about it is that they can actually express themselves, different identities in different gaming spaces at a different cost. So for $5, $10, I mean, Ralph Lauren famously increased their digital, um, their, their revenues on digital assets by 40%. 
due to the uh, distribution of digital assets in gaming platforms like Zepetto, which are only $5. So it's aspirational as well. So if you're looking at, you've got your Metro core, but then you have your non-core, you're thinking, well, how can I bridge that gap? How can I make this accessible? Instead of you know, being Gucci and selling you know, cheap belts and having that drive the revenue, you can also think of is diffusing the brand in virtual spaces. So it's a, it's a great alternative to get very high ROI and to expose your brand to a new generation. Okay. I'm still a little on the fence, so let's see if we can uh, get Daniel's help on this. Uh, but before I come to you, Daniel, I want to tell you one of the sh super shortest short stories I've ever read, author called, science fiction author called Frederick Brown. He wrote the story about the building of the world's first supercomputer, where all, essentially all the computers in the world were hooked up together to make one, and we have some version of that today that exists already, and I guess AI in another form is the same thing. So the guy who invented it, uh, through the switch, turned it on, you hear this ominous hum all over the world and then the guy who funded it, let's say the president of the earth or whatever it is, is uh, given the honor of asking the first question to this computer. So he asks, is there a God? And there is an answer that comes out of prick apparently nowhere saying, yes, now there is. The scientist realizes what's happened and he tries to turn the switch off from a clear blue sky, a bolt of lightning fuses the switch and strikes the scientist dead. Based on that short story, are we headed there, Daniel? That's a, a, a big question. Uh, uh, we might need uh, so, so I guess um, the development of large language models over the past several decades um, have been, they've been doing interesting things. We've been able to get them to recognize objects and images and things like that. And around 10 billion neurons, they started to do something very interesting, which is encapsulate lots of knowledge, encapsulate an understanding of language, how the world works. I think my expectation is over the next decade, we will see in the next few years, these large language models moving from being like a intoxicated graduate in your pocket to like a master's level so they'll be able to reason and then in a few more years we'll be able to uh, give it a, an, a complex objective function like a PhD and it'll be able to go and try and address that and, and, and determine whether that hypothesis is true and then a few years later we'll, we'll probably have a professor in our pocket that's as smart as all of us which is AGI and then the question is that if you give it then the, the task of building a smarter AI, we, we could very quickly see what is called a fast takeoff where we see uh, 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 this intelligence going from as smart as all of us to a million times smarter than all of us, which is super intelligence. And we could take a long time, it could take years, but I think my community think that we'll achieve AGI by the end of this decade, decade, uh, and um, that means we could see super intelligence in, in, the, in the next 20 years. Wait, we, are you saying six years? We're all going yeah, to be out of work? Sam Altman, not necessarily out of work, I guess. Not just out of work that it, you're talking it, about. Yeah. It's Sam, Sam, I think Sam Altman and others believe that by the end of this decade we'll achieve a, a AGI. And then we don't know when super intelligence will come, but the concern is, is it, it is potentially either the most glor glorious thing that happens to us or our biggest existential threat. My worry is that if this thing th sees us as a threat, then it will remove us from the equation. Now, even our ability to make more super intelligences, it might see us as a threat, so it might prevent us from doing that. I hope that it will find some interesting dimensions out there and just leave without taking all of our resources with it. Uh, but I do say to people that when it comes, look busy, be nice to each other, and hopefully it will, uh, it will go away. <laughs> We are going to have to end this on a hopeful note, so we'll take that. So it's not dystopia, it's utopia we're painting and Daniel painted this yesterday as well. He said, we will also be reaching economic singularity where none of us will have to work. Free food, free housing, free clothes, free virtual goods as well. And then what the hell will we do with our time? We'll we will get to be creative, we'll be making more Nikes and Gucci's and so on and so forth for ourselves. We'll be in the metaverse. <laughs> We'll be in the metaverse. But you also said something e equally useful and I think all the great scientists from Einstein have said this, that 
mankind exists because we have purpose. At the end of everything, our purpose used to be quite simple and banal. We used to be about getting food and clothing and bringing our children up say, in a safe environment, etc. When we reach the utopia, Daniel promises, within two decades maximum, minimum probably by another 10 years, what is it, 2030, at that time, our purpose will be to attain our higher selves, uh, new uh, next level of evolution for humankind, I suspect, Inshallah. and into that free world, let us all arrive. Yeah? Let's hope so. It sounds really positive. <laughs> I'll, I'll sign on that. I certainly hope for that. On that uh, cheerful note, thank you guys. And thank you. congratulations. Thank you.